Well, hello there, and welcome to Brainwaves, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. Now, I'm Jamie Adams, and I'm joined by my co-host Ian McAllister here. Say hello, Ian. Hi. And if you listened to the cast last time, you may have heard we were preparing for our wonderful award ceremony. There was going to be lights, a smoke machine, glitter, more glitter, a star cloth, everything. I, I just really like Claire. But somebody, who uh, shall remain nameless, decided to overspend on the glitter budget and backstage food. What do you have to say for yourself, Ian? Look, uh, I, gave, I gave it to the other Ian, the intern, and uh, it, it was all his fault. You need to stop blaming the interns. We'll get that Ian on and replace you one of these days. I, I mean, I run the place. You can't replace me. We shall see. Well, we don't have a fancy set, but what we do have is the comfy, cosy armchairs and roaring log fire of RPG Corner, which we're just relaxing in for today. And welcome to our awards of 2019. Yes, so I did overspend a little and we are relaxing in an RPG corner and as with last year, our awards are not for necessarily the best game of the year. We don't get to see a lot of the new releases sometimes and, and the team don't get to play a lot of them. So our awards are they're a little bit different. There are the things that we want to give awards out for to games that we have played this year and we're going to start at the top with our best short game, a game that plays in under 30 minutes. Jamie, what's your... What's your best game, short game from the year that plays under 30 minutes? All my games this year are games that I played for the first time in 2019. They might not necessarily be from that year, but it's my first encounter with them. And this is one such game, and it is Cockroach Poker by Jacques Zime, art by Rolf Vogt, Vogt possibly, uh, published in the UK by Coil Spring Games and Drei Magier Spiele. I flip in love this Wii game. Very simple rules, very devious, really nice bluffing, and it's a one where you can, you know, it's a small box, you can take it out, you can play it almost anywhere. The rules are fairly simple, and you can get people of all ages playing it. I've had five year olds play it, I've had 60 odd year olds play it, and everything in between. One of my favourite gaming moments from this year was watching uh, kids lie to their parents successfully at the Juniper Green board game club that I go to. And the parents' realisation that the child had just lied successfully was uh, priceless. I've yet to play it with my mother, uh, has to be said, because I know from playing other games, I can't lie to my mum. <laughs> Well, for me, my game is also a little bit about lying. This is a game that Jamie brought to Tabletop Scotland this year, and it's called Tortuga 1667. Now, this is by Travis Hancock, with artists Holly Hancock and Sarah Keel from Facade Games. And it is a beautifully presented little game. It's in the... I can't remember what the series of games is called, but they've basically produced us a series of these small games that basically look like little books fantastic things there's uh, one called salem in that series and one called deadwood as well yes there is salem 1692 and there is deadwood 1876 it is a series called the dark cities series that's the one and tortuga is a game basically about sort of being pirate privateers allying yourself to either france or britain and pushing yourself up ships and sort of basically a little bit of social deduction in there and trying to sort of remain on the right side and push your own little agenda and it's a great little package fantastically put together wonderful game for not very much money plays in under 30 minutes and i'm not a great fan of social deduction just on its own but when it's in a game like this when it's got a little bit more bite to it i really really love it and yeah tortuga really floats my boat pun intended you're gonna have no this game for me, as Ian said, I brought the game to Tabletop Scotland. I flip and love this game. Yeah, it's great. Fantastic. Right. The next category, the next award we have for you is the award for best rule book. Now, I don't know about you, Ian. I actually haven't read that many rule books this year. I mean, I've read a good few, seen the review number of review copies and that kind of thing that I do, especially from Kickstarters, but they're not always the finished article, so I can't really comment on those too much. So my my rulebook is actually a Kickstarter that I 
did receive a preview copy of. We reviewed it last year, uh, but the final game came out this year. It's Villagers from Sinister Fish Games and designed and illustrated by Hook. Hakon Garder, I hope he's got his name right there. But it's a great little sort of tableau building game of building little sort of economic engines in a village with villagers who, with all due respect to Hakon's art, those villagers have definitely seen some things <laughs> and we're not quite sure what they are. But the game itself is fantastic. It's a great little package. I, I really love small box games as listeners to this podcast and readers to the site probably know. And this is a great example of that. Lots of little expansions in there lovely wooden coins and the rulebook is really well put together lots of great illustrations really well really well explained i don't think i've had a very many problems at all with the rulebook it's really well laid out and it fits in the box nicely and it's it's a nice format as well it's nice to, easy to hold in the hand and sort of refer to as you play fantastic work from the the folks at since fish games and hack on what about yourself jamie yeah, my award actually will go to uh, a game I first saw and heard about from esteemed board game site Shut Up and Sit Down, and that is Bargain Quest, designed by Jonathan Ying, art by Victoria Ying, and published by Renegade Game Studios. I find this rulebook just quite simple, but very clear. And if I do need to you know, look up a rule, it's very simple and kind of easy to understand where where they're coming from and there's very little how would i put it interpretation of rules one of the reasons we like to give this award out we like to talk about this kind of thing is both jamie and i are sticklers for good rule books and it's an art to write in a, there's an art to write in a good rule book it is a skill and we still think it's a skill that's not really talked about enough in the industry. We we see people like uh, Paul Grogan from Gaming Rules who's a really good rule book editor and does some really good playthrough videos he's got a bit of a patron drive running right now if you want to go and help paul out with his work but the, this sort of stuff just isn't really talked about enough and we'd really like to see a little bit more conversation about how do you write a good, good rule book what is a what are great examples of good rule books and what lessons can everyone learn from those rule books and yeah we just still like to start that conversation watching uh, a video by the dice tower recently um, I saw they make a comment about uh, a particular game, a very high-profile game that was released this year, but was let down from a lot of circles, apparently, by its rulebook, which was a bit shoddy. And What was the game, Jamie? Name names. The game was Batman uh, Gotham City Chronicles. Yeah, like a lot of the reviews for that game said, yeah, this rulebook, no, <laughs> basically. Yeah, uh, and I yeah. there, you know, there's the comment that we're seeing overall an increase in quality in the industry and at times you know you're looking at independently published games and you're going that's independently published that looks fantastic and you're seeing games that are produced by big companies and you're going that's a game produced by a big company really but you know a rule book which is sometimes your first encounter with the game itself that needs to set out a good example and provide clear logical yeah. instructions also if last year's Spiel de Jahres award, there was a note put out by the judges saying, we had to disqualify a lot of games because of their rule books. We are not proofreaders. This is, yeah. this, is, this is unacceptable, pretty much. Yeah, and it's one of the things we have on our site now is that we take on a review copy, uh, with be that uh, a full retail or Kickstarter preview, that we are not rules editors and if your rule book is hard to understand it's going to delay us getting our review done because we'll have to come back to you and ask questions and it's always yeah. a problem never let it anyway. say we won't give it a good run it's just no. a good rule book we'll just elevate that game and go okay this is how you do it anyway moving on from the complicated world of rule books let's move on to our award for best original screenplay so this is an award for story in game the sort of emergent stories or specific stories you get from a particular game jamie what's yours for this year sneaking in at the very very end like a slow knife penetrating the shield we have <laughs> it's it's a reference to to the to the intellectual and now all question. i'm thinking about is stinging his underpants <laughs> Ian, that's your own prerogative. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Dune. Dune, that holy grail of board games regarded by some. There's been a new reprint from Gale Force 9, designed, the classic designed by Bill Eberle, 
Eberl, I don't know, Jack Kitteredge, and Peter Olotka, with beautiful art by Ilya Baranovsky. It's a very nice looking game. I mean, the box for me is just one of my favourite pieces of box art. Wonderfully evocative sandworm and beautiful. I got a copy of Dune about a week or so ago, as we're recording this, and we've played part of one game. We couldn't do the whole game due to time restrictions. But even those three turns that we played, the story that we had, you know, these great dynastic factions. The first turn of the game, I was playing the Fremen, the native inhabitants of of Dune, and I launched an, an assault against the Spicing Guild, who decided to try and steal the spice that was nearby. And I, I, I messed up so badly, but it was that wonderful moment of going, oh my goodness, I can't believe that happened! And... It just changed, and that wonderful story that we had, it was like, yeah, we, we leapt in, and turns out it was a massive, a massive uh, cluster of fruitcake. What I'm trying to say is those three turns had me so emotionally involved. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Yeah, we were talking about it, you know, a, a week or two, a week later, and we're still wanting to, to get together and play it again. And I just heard there's an, yeah. annou- uh, an expansion being announced, so I am a little bit oh, excited. Oh, right, wow. Cool. Yeah, that's definitely one for me to check out. It, it, enough of me uh, spouting off about, about Dune. Uh, what is your choice for the award? Well, from sci-fi epics to smaller fantasy games, I love Roleplayer. So Roleplayer is a game from Thunderworks Games designed by Keith Mateshka, artists JJ Arosa and Louis Francisco. So this is a game about heroes before they're heroes. Effectively what you're doing in Roleplayer is you are making an RPG character as you play, rolling dice, putting them into stat blocks, gaining on equipment and quirks and all sorts of things, and basically accumulating points in various ways over the course of the game but what you get through that play what you get emerging out of that is a story of a character so you have little backstory cards and things that you're filling out and lots of weird little things happening one of the very first times i played this uh i was basically playing a priest who didn't like to buy anything at all so just sort of through through threw things away constantly in order to get points and money <laughs> and you just just these lovely little bits of emergent story that come out of this and i picked up the monsters and minions expansion as well which basically means that at the end of your creating your character you all go off and fight your first monster as well and it's just this lovely little bit of storytelling within this game and it's 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 a it's quite a complicated little puzzle game i, I really like it for that there's quite a lot to chew on but the I... little emergent stories you get for each character are just fantastic. Uh, I think I've played it only once with you and yeah. Dimension Traveller Sam. Uh, yeah. I think I was a little bit cool on it, but I can see where you're seeing that, that wonderful story emerge from. Yeah. I did have fun with it, but I yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from. But it's yeah. maybe something I might go, you know what? I'm glad you enjoy it. I just, I just love that sort of emergent story that comes out of it. Really good stuff. So we've got a new one up next. This is our best blacklist game. So if you are not familiar with the term, the Hollywood blacklist is a bunch of scripts that Hollywood is very interested in, but no one has fully optioned yet. They're sort of flowing around Hollywood, not really being picked up by a studio yet, but they probably will be in the next sort of couple of years. So this is going to be our best game that we have played, but isn't out yet. Effectively, these will be mostly sort of kickstarter games which we do get to see of a few of during the year now for myself this has been magnate the first city so that's from nailer games designed by james nailer with artist artist she lee I, I think I think you I think you've mentioned it. I, I think I think we may have had James on the podcast, haven't we? We have indeed had James on the podcast. He did in fact try to buy Brainways HQ from us because he's he's a he's a fantastic property magnet. But and Magnet does allow you to step into the shoes of like a sort of slimy property developer, really just out for all the money you can get. James originally designed it with the idea that it's the game Monopoly was meant to be, but it's so much more than that. It's got this fantastic financial market that responds to all the players actions a crash will eventually come you basically just got to push yourself as far as you can to get as much money as you can before the crash happens great little game it's been fully backed it's just uh it's just all, all funded on kickstar it's going to be out sort of octoberish next year i backed it myself because i really really love the game and uh yeah you can read our preview up on the site as well really good game 
watch out for her next year. That's going to be fantastic when it comes out. Hopefully, in time for Christmas next year. Yeah, I was, I was, I was impressed by Magnate's well, the prototype that I played the copy. Yeah, of the one of the nicest prototypes I was impressed we've ever by that, played. That prototype, and it was, it was a nice game. I don't think it's the kind of theme that I'm a big fan of. I think property development and stock markets isn't really my thing. Uh, my, me neither. I just really loved it. But you know, it it was enjoyable. It was fun, and I did win which I think I'm more of a sleazy <laughs> property developer than I realize. Well, I've always thought of you that way. What about for yourself? Now, I like to think I could never be called an adherent to the cult of the new, the, that some might say almost slavish need for the newest, hottest board games coming out, he says, having recently bought a copy of Dune. Um, moving away very quickly. This is a game that Ian and I both played at UK Games Expo. This is pretty Cult of the New because it was in very, I think it was still in its development stages. And we it was, got called hipsters for having this as our game of the call. Yeah, and I've never felt more relevant, I say that. <laughs> um, when we were demoed the game, it was called Chapter 2, but it has since been branded Rift Force. This is a game from One More Time Games, designed by Carlo Bortolini, with art by Miguel Coimbra. And it's a two-player, you know, steady yourselves, deck-building game. Jamie likes a deck-building game. What the heck's going on? I wouldn't call it deck-building, really. You sort of, no? you sort of choose some, you choose some powers, and you get a bunch of cards that you then shuffle together. You don't really deck-build over the course of the okay. game. As such. My, my, I, I would call it a deck-building game in as much as Ian. Do you have a deck of cards? Do you get to choose what cards go in there? Do you, in fact, yeah. build a deck? Yeah. But it's, anyway. it's but it's yeah. I I the deck building game in the vaguest sense of the term. It's air a little bit of area control with really nice asymmetric player powers. And yeah, I, fantastically. I think, done. I think this year I've realised that I really enjoy asymmetry in games. Mm. Uh, Rift Force I found very slick, very you know even in its you know early de- development stages. Yeah, very slick, very played very nicely. I didn't. I didn't feel like I was being stupid by going, hang on, what does this do again? Okay, everything was very clear. There was yeah. no real weird things. Everything made sense. And yeah, I was I was thoroughly impressed. I think they're coming to Kickstarter next year sometime. So hopefully we'll see them back for Games Expo next year with a, a more I'm complete copy. Break my, break my Kickstarter uh, fast. Well, I'll be back in it most likely. Yeah. So we're now moving on to the award for the best production or indeed the most overproduced game. This is a, an award suggested by our good friend Richard from We're Not Wizards podcast. That naughty, naughty wizard man. Indeed. Ian, my award is a game that came out last year, but I bought earlier this year, I at the beginning of the year. I also bought its expansion. And I think I messaged you going, I think I've done something a bit naughty. And I have bought Root by Cole Verla, at art by Carl Ferrin, and published by Later Games. I think Root's production is wonderful. First of all, I think the box size is just excellent. I expect it to be much larger. Uh, it wasn't as, you know, it snugly fits all the pieces that you need. The screen printed animal meeples are quite gorgeous i think the tokens the dice i i you know this bleeds slightly into art but i think it looks wonderful i think all the stuff is really nice that kind of comes with you that the tokens a really nice feel of them the the satisfaction of just placing your you know the different animal meeples the different faction meeples on the board and you're like oh yeah this is cool and the expansion had that as well and it looks really yeah, good. Yeah, it is lovely. I'm, I'm, I am probably going to pick it up next year. I think I might pick it up for my group, like that, the first sort of the core and the first expansion, because it is a great game. It I is. really like it. And and I have the Underworld expansion, which I kickstarted, coming very soon. So awesome. I probably won't shut up about it anytime soon. Sorry, but I actually quite enjoy it. I also managed to get uh, Ben from the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast playing it, and he really enjoys it as well. So I've I've converted him. Excellent. Yeah, I think there's a new a new printing of it coming out start next year. Or so I think there is. Yeah, it's, going, it's, it's, going to be it's very good. That. It's it's quite yeah. Ian, I believe you have something quite different actually. 
Yeah, so on the other end of the spectrum, uh, I have a role-playing game product. So this is the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition Starter Set. I picked this up earlier in the year and I ran a little bit of it. And if you've been reading the blog recently, you know I stopped because I sort of bounced off the sort of old school requirements of running that particular game. But that is not to put disparage the product at all it's fantastically put together thing it's what i really want from a role-playing game box set it's got fantastic sort of trifold character sheets like a big picture of your character a bit of description of them that you can read before you open the thing out inside it's got sort of all the rules for your character in there inside the character sheet all little sort of little, little helps for you Te- it teaches a gm how, sort of how to run it takes you through sort of a starter scenario, taking you through scene by scene, how to do certain mechanics and that kind of thing. It's got a lovely set of Key Workshop dice in there, maps of the town and the area you're in. It's all full color, just a lovely put together thing. And it's not bank breakingly expensive at all. It's a really good intro to that world and to that role playing game and to role playing games in general. It's the sort of thing I really wanted to see from the original D and D starter set. Though I do believe the new Essentials edition is a much better put together product, but I haven't seen that yet. But yeah, really nice thing. So that is designed and developed by um, Dominic McDowell and Andy Law from Cubicle 7. It's obviously had a bunch of other designers and artists and that kind of thing involved over the years. And it is wonderful to see it coming back, you know, in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's accessible to people. It's no longer just the occasional yeah. hardcover book in a charity shop. Yeah, they're going to be re-releasing a lot of the old classic campaigns like Empire and Flames and that kind of thing as well. They are coming soon. So yeah, that's Waffer Up 4th Edition Star Set Cubicle 7. So moving on, we are going to look at the art in games. Now, if early in the year we had Ross from More Games Please on the show, and if you really want to look at cool art and games we do absolutely recommend his site. He specifically looks at artists in board games and is currently running a nomination for the best art of the year in board games. You can go and nominate your favorite games there. So this is our best visual effects award and award for art and games. Jamie, what's yours? I think we might have heard about this game just just now. <laughs> you might have. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit. I have I have one game and two very honorable mentions. My award for visual effect goes to, surprise, surprise, considering I gushed about it just now, Root. I think Kyle Ferrin's art is just gorgeous. Every faction feels different, and this wonderful dynamism in the in the art, even in the cards. Every time uh, people have seen the card, Mouse in a Sack, they just giggle yep. because it's mouse a mouse sack with fantastic. this kind of manic expression and a dagger just hiding yep. in a bag. And it's it's beautiful and... I can't wait to see what, what the new expansion is going to bring. You know, every, you know, the 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 map itself just feels really nice and wonderful. The wonderful colors um, of the it's very clear trees. as well. It's not yeah. just pretty, but it's very functional as well. Like you can tell where things are. It's functional. It's evocative. Yeah, I'm. I'm no. You know, I can't talk a great deal about art, but it's it it's wonderful and it does make things feel a little bit better for me. You know, it it adds to that the feel of the game when you can see you know the art or oh, this is what this these guys look like where you can just imagine them just leaping on these cats for example and, and yeah. beating them to a pulp um a little side note again a little side note uh one of my screen printed members of the woodland alliance which are the kind of rebel alliance faction in the game one of the screen prints had a little bit uh the eyes were kind of rubbing off so i've just taken a sharpie and drawn like an eye patch and some grizzled look on him so now it's my little it's like my little my little mouse general it's cool. And what were, what were your honourable mentions? Honourable mentions go to Parks, first one, by Henry Audubon. Uh, and the art is part of the 59 Parks print series, which is a series of prints, fun enough, celebrating the national parks of the United States of America and its territories. Some of them are beautifully evocative, wonderful, you know, lots of different artists, lots of different styles, each capturing its own particular feel of a national park and that art is carried over it's this wonderful kind of almost pastely shades in some places collecting these cards it's it's cards that you want to look at and go oh they look really really nice yeah you want to put you want to print them out and put them on your wall yeah and there is a you can actually buy the prints which is quite nice um, yeah yeah but this is published by Keymaster games i would recommend having a wee look at it it's really nice and my second honorable mention goes to bosk now, I have talked in the past about Photosynthesis, a game about trees. Bosk is a game about trees. This is designed by Daryl Andrews and Erica Boyoris. 
Art by Quanshai Moria and Matt Paquette and published by Floodgate Games. This is a game I played with you, Ian, and the boys from Polyhedron Collider at Indeed. UK Games Expo. We need to have a rematch sometime as well, We actually. do, we do. I think, uh, I think a rematch is in order because I got stomped by you all. Uh, but I, I, picked I, it up. I drew. I picked it up and I think it's this beautiful, kind of sweeping, wonderful forest vistas, the trees... Have these, you know, wonderful look again. It's those unique look of it. The board, it's wonderful, you know, very pastel shades, like yellow next to red, next to pink. Like this wonderful stream kind of running through it. Yeah, I think it looks wonderful. And if that idealistic forest idea. I've had enough of your trees and lakes and pastel colours. Let's go over something more modern, more gritty. My nomination for the art in games is Chronicles of Crime from Lucky Duck Games. This is designed by David Cerserol, and I'm not going to do uh, the dishonour of trying to mispronounce all the artists' names, because I will get them very badly wrong, but we will put a link in the show notes to those. But basically, this is a game about sort of modern detective stories, sort of like daytime TV detective. And one of the things I really, really like about it is that uh, basically what you're doing in Chronicles of Crime is you're trying to solve mysteries by scanning cards into an app that sort of gives you bits of story. And you can sort of scan, like a piece of glass that's got some blood on it into uh, into your forensic lab and they'll tell you stuff about it. But one of the things I really, really like about this game is a lot of the cards are faces of potential suspects or people you can talk to and each of them is individual in their own way and enough individuality has been put into those faces that you don't even really need to remember the names as you go. You can you can remember that that guy or that per- that woman is connected to this piece of evidence or you can go and ask them about that or they they're at this particular location and you can there's just enough in there to really sort of connect with the faces without having to remember every individual name and it's really really cool that those little bits of art and i know it's not more of a an art thing it's more of a, a gameplay thing but i like the fact that the faces there's no text on them there's just the qr code so yeah. that person who was for example a murder suspect in the first case could show up again in the sixth case but it's not the same person it's they look similar but they're like some guy or like a, a witness to a crime yeah as i was saying because it because it's like that daytime detective tv thing it's like seeing the same actor doing different things over the course of several yeah, episodes it's yes. got that kind of feel to it and i really really like that about chronicles of crime it's really good i'll have a review of that coming out fairly soon once i've played just a little bit more of it to get a handle on it moving on from art and games we now want to have a little chat about what we think is the most innovative thing that we have played this year though now again of course we haven't played everything that's out this year and we maybe not have played some of the titles that a lot of people are sort of shouting from the rooftops about in terms of innovation but these are our own particular choices so for me again and we're going to come back to chronicles of crime because although i have some little misgivings about some of the writing in the game uh, and somehow some of the story is told yep. i think it's a fantastically put together toolbox for telling those kind of stories and i can see them doing lots with it the sort of qr system is a is a really good example of app integration into games and it actually made me believe in qr codes again they were used they were meant to be a thing and then they just kind of weren't technology wise and it really made me believe in those because it's so quick it's so interesting you can really combine things together to to sort of try and get through the case in your own way and you really feel like you're investigating that thing it might maybe mucks up occasionally like occasionally my phone was a little too sensitive to pick up to and picked up too many things that did happen and cost us some time but as a sort of to, as a toolbox for storytelling i think it's really interesting and they have also opened up the software to tell stories and a lot of the community the community are making stories inside chronicles of crime and i can see them producing more of that kind of thing in the coming year i would they've seemed to have finished the expansions for the core set so they have the core set and two expansions both of which fit in that box so i wouldn't be surprised to see a new set coming out next year maybe set in a different time period maybe telling completely different kinds of stories really interesting product what about for yourself jamie what would you what did you think was the most innovative thing this you played this year well i've was been looking around playing a couple of games here and there and i happened upon a little game by the name of icarus a storytelling game about how great civilizations fall this is a game by spencer stark with art by kent davis ryan richmond and spencer stark and published by renegade game studios uh, how would i describe it a cooperative storytelling game with uh, no 
GM character, uh, in which pretty much the game's actually explained in the name. You make a great civilization, and then you just run it into the flipping ground. It is really great little product. And again, like we were talking about the Wafrup starter set earlier on, it's a really interesting intro into that sort of storytelling games, that sort of role-playing game kind of kind of product. Uh, and I'd, I, I'd really want to see more of that kind of thing. Little box products that are really cool storytelling games. It's really interesting. Yeah, it, it's, a small bo- it's a small box. And I mean, I got the, the boxed edition, but you don't need it. There are rules at the back of the book for if you want to use normal dice... And playing cards, because it comes with various stages of the civilization going into ruin. And you can use a normal set of playing cards, and it'll just say, right, this card is this. This card signifies that. And using normal dice in place of the the dice that are part of the game, just says, yep, okay, uh, you can use that. It's rolls of these are the ones that cause you to succeed at your task, for example. Now, we've we've seen, you know, that kind of physical building of of a tower or physical use of a prop in a, a role-playing game most famously i think with dread the one-shot horror role-playing game which centers around a jenga tower and to do tasks you take a jenga block and you have to pull it out if you don't you fail your task if you knock the tower over your character dies we've also seen it with starcross which i believe won the diana jones award this year yes it did. Uh, again it was it's a relationship simulator uh, I say that, it sounds a bit unfair. But it's a relationship role-playing game which has a Jenga tower as one of its core mechanics. So we've seen that before. But I think the story of physically building this monument out of dice, which symbolises the monument that you as a civilization, are building in the, the framework of the story, seeing that ramp up and seeing as that gets bigger, how much more the civilization just gets worse and worse and it gets really on edge as you just add more and going oh it's gonna fall it's gonna fall it's gonna fall and when it doesn't fall for a a cooperative storytelling game i think it's a game that i think truly embodies that because there's no games master character there's no player there's, there's everyone going well, what about this yeah what about that what if we do this that's a great idea how about this as well Ooh. That's nice. And you know, yeah, building a narrative really story good. with pieces of paper that will change and develop and failure. One big thing for me, failure and success, you know, it's just two sides of the same coin. Failure can be just as good as success. So yeah, I I think it's done in a really nice way and I would you know, it, obviously it always depends on your group. Yeah. If you want to see it being played, uh, we'll put in a link to Dicebreaker who have got a little sort of playthrough of the game and how it plays and you can get an idea of exactly what happens with that uh, and that'll give you a good impression of how, how the game goes let's move on to our last two uh, so this our next one is best director uh, which is basically an award for the best publisher so board game publisher that we really enjoyed this year jamie i think i know what yours is yeah i mentioned it a couple of times let's see i've mentioned bargain quest i've mentioned icarus is that the only two, I think? I think that's the only two. Ex Libris was on your list last year, if I remember Ex Libris right. was on my list last year, a game that I, I do rather enjoy. Um, Raiders of the North Sea. I was about to say Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that's not a game. That's a film, Jamie. Probably on at Christmas. The whole North Sea saga, um, if I said games like, ooh, Altiplano or Lantern. Get to the point, man. It's Renegade Game Studios. I think they've been doing some fantastic games over the past couple of years. And I just, yeah, yeah. I think I think they're going to get better, you know, better and better. Wide range of interesting games, well produced, lovely art. Yeah, the, yeah it's, it's really nice to see work. them not focusing on say, like one particular thing. It's a nice, a nice milieu, if you will. I think their production quality is overall very nice. Again, some really nice games, some really nice themes as well. I know it sounds really yeah, and a good variety as well. A good variety of like sort of yeah, light, yeah, heavy, all sorts, all sorts in there. Really yeah. good catalog. A very nice catalog, and I just hope that that's going to build and continue. My nomination is Big Potato Games, and this is a publisher that reaches out beyond sort of the normal sort of hobby games. You'll see them all over the place. You'll see games of theirs on the shelf at Tesco's, as well as the shelf of your local friendly game store. They produce a lot of interesting sort of party games, and 
I've been really impressed with the way they have sort of reached out beyond the sort of core of the hobby to really bring people in to to our hobby to act to sort of show off what board games can be the fun they can be and they produce a lot of really cool interesting games wide variety of stuff from sort of silly word games to strange games about drawing things which we'll come on to very shortly they just had a review from shopton down of their game called uh, don't get got which is a really weird party game about basically sort of like tricking people into doing various things for you ian what games have they made because you've talked about how good they are but people might go I've not heard of them. I've not. I, you know, I'd like to hear more about them. What games have they made? They've made games like uh, they've made like games like Scroll, Don't Get Got. I just mentioned uh, they've made the Blockbuster game recently, which we reviewed on the site. They made Chameleon, Twenty Second Showdown, for example. Twenty Second Showdown, uh, Bucket of Doom, Bucket of Doom, okay, Obama Lama, Obama Lama. The focus tends to be on party games, but that's not a bad thing. And they're really light, really easy to pick up games that are that just are really good fun to play. Really, really impressed with Big Potato this year. Blockbuster was great fun. Really much better than I expected it to be. And, well, we might as well get on to our best game that we've played this year that wasn't released this year. So this is effectively our Game of the Year award because we don't get to play a lot of the new hotness. So for me, it was Scrawl from Big Potato Games. So this is effectively Pictionary meets Telephone. So what happens in Scrawl is you get like a subject and you... The first person, when you get that subject, you draw it on a little sort of white, dry white board. You then pass it to the person to your left, who puts a dry white board on top of that thing, having a look at what you've drawn, and then writes what they think you drew. That gets past the person to the left, who draws what that person wrote, and so on and so forth around the circle until it gets back to you. And then you have this amazing little sort of progress of from what you originally were given to draw, right back round to what actually people think you drew in the end and it's never failed to entertain it's absolutely hilarious really good game it's a little risque to play with kids they've got like a sort of normal version and they've got a slightly less risque version which takes out some of the more uh, controversial subjects out of the game i still think that version has got a little bit of risk to it and Mm -hmm. i would really like to see them produce a more child-friendly version so that families can play it together a bit more easily but other than that, I think it's a fantastic party game and the more the merrier with that one. You can play it with up to eight people, probably more if you particularly fancied it. But yeah, it really, really sings with sort of like six to eight people. Fantastic time. Absolutely hilarious. I completely agree. I think Scroll is an absolutely wonderful game. Uh, it never fails to produce hilarity whenever I've played it and just... Yeah. And also it's one of those games where I love that you you don't have to be a good drawer. In fact, it's sometimes no, even funnier not. if you're a bad drawer because you're just like, how is that raised by squirrels? It looks like Pikachu in a lift. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you some photos of uh, the, some of the ones we've had at some yeah, point. They're, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. Amazing and ridiculous, and I, I, I think it's great. I notice you're cheating again and have got two on the list for your best games. Try and stop me, Ian. Try Monster. and stop me. I'm going to... I have a joint... Well, I'm the editor, so I can do what I like. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm one half of you, so I can do what I... Anyway, my first pick is a game I mentioned already, and it is Cockroach Poker. For all the reasons that I said previously, it's short, it's quick, you can play it with any age, it's great fun. The gleam in your eye as someone just turns over the card and you reveal that everyone has been lying to you apart from the last person. Oh, it's wonderful. I think I've had more games of that than almost anything else this year, and... I think it's wonderful, and I've got lots of people who I know interested in it and playing it as well, which makes me feel almost a pride there. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I've got these people interested in it. And my second one, well, if you listen to the podcast, you know that I've been going on for a long time about a mega game, and that is Watch the Sky's second site that I played at UK Games Expo this year. Thanks to John Meisen from Southwest Mega Games and Alex Beck of Horizon Mega Games. Oh my goodness. I had such good fun. A mega game, for those of you who may not have heard, is the best way to describe it, a mix between a board game, a role-playing game, and a LARP, which is a live-action role-play. You can play either like senior figures in a country, you can play corporations, or you can play aliens. Or you can play the press as well, actually, which is good fun. And aliens have come to Earth. Why? You don't know, unless you're the aliens. Find out why. Keep your country slash corporation alive, or if the aliens... 
stay alive and do what you have to do. And, and you're burying the lead, I think, here. Who were you in this mega game, Jamie? I was the Prime Minister of Japan. He was indeed, ladies and gentlemen. And you can read all about Jamie's exploits on the site. He wrote a very extensive diary, which went down very well with our readers. If We will obviously link to that in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good breakdown of what Jamie got up to in that mega game. It sounds fantastic, and we're hoping to maybe go to one next year, maybe? Yes, there is a True North Mega Games, which is a mega game company that runs games in the north of england and scotland and there's at least three or four games that are going to be in scotland over 2020 so i'm hoping to make at least one of them yeah hopefully me too. Go, hopefully uh the most the next one which is called den of wolves which is which definitely is not game. battlestar galactica on this governor yeah it's a mega game of politics and survival in the 27th century designed by john meisen yeah, and John was on our podcast earlier in the year talking about Meg Games and what they're all about as well. And thanks very much for John for coming on for that. Well, I think that's about all we have time for. We'd like to thank all our patrons uh, and especially our executive producers, the Lucky Sparrow Game Cafe, and our newest patron, Mr. James Naylor, who we were speaking to earlier on the cast. Thank you very much, James, for joining our patrons. We really appreciate that. We're we're so grateful, and we're not just saying that because you were on the podcast and stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, we'd like to thank all our patrons who have supported us over the last year. So we just recently changed up the patron uh, support pledges, so do check that out. You now get access to all our, basically, content extras for just $1 a month. So do check that out if you want to give us a wee Christmas present and join our patron. We'll be taking a little break over the holidays to relax, to unwind... Uh, and for Ian to pay what he owes out of the awards budget. But don't worry, dear listener, because we will be back on the 20th of January with more best in board game and tabletop gaming news. Until then, say goodbye, Ian. Goodbye, Ian. And I'm Jamie. This is a goodbye from Jamie. Have a wonderful festive time, everybody. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>